what's up guys welcome to episode seven of a day in the life of a sports trader it's around two o'clock right now we just woke up man these mornings never get easier um went golf yesterday went to the golf club golf club played a bit of golf and wasn't playing too well so when i go back i usually you know when i'm bored I swing the club in front of my TV screen over here because I use a reflection. And I was swinging the golf club and the club head, let me show you, went flying off. Look at that. Club head went flying off and smacked the TV. So now the TV is cracked. Right there, in the middle. So the TV's permanently broken now. So I called Samsung and they recommended a local TV repair service. And I called them up and they told me it's going to be £400 to replace the screen, which is absolutely ridiculous. So I've got to buy a new TV now, which I'm really pissed off about. But thankfully, Black Friday's coming up. So I'm going to have to spend another 500 to a to £1,000 or whatever it is they cost. So, um, Hopefully we can make that money back, or at least some of that back in today's session. Um, usual drill, we're going to trade some Australian racing and then follow that up with some cricket. I ran a poll this week and you guys said you want to see me uh, do some cricket and some golf. So we've got a one day series between Australia and England going on right now and we're currently on the second game. So hopefully make some money for that. Um, but yeah, we'll give it a go, see how it goes. Alright, first race of the day. Let's get cracking. Ballarat. Fairly decent liquidity here. And we're going to get stuck in right in play. And as usual, we're just going to jump in front of the lay money here on this third favourite. Um, As you can see, there's a, a good three, 400 quid here stacked up on the lay side and there's hardly any money backing it. So we're just waiting to catch a spike uh, upwards on here. As soon as this lay money starts getting e eaten up, then we'll have to scratch our position, but we look good in that regard. And it's gonna scale out a bit of our money and should make 20 quid there of the first race so nice start i us back to morfordville and the liquidity is pretty poor in this track but just given how dire the action uh is today we're gonna have to try and look for opportunity wherever we can so as you can see in play it's looking a lot more different to uh ballarat um so really gonna have to lower our stakes and just be more selective with our positions here by the way, I'm probably not going to show every single race today, just so we've got time to show the Australian racing. Otherwise, this video is going to be way too long. So I'm just going to cram in the main action um, in this video and just skip out the poor quality races such as this one, where it looks like I'm going to have to scratch for around two, three pound loss. So races like this, I'm, I'm just going to glaze over and we'll just stick with the main action. Okay, Kembla Grange. Now this track has got slightly better liquidity than Morfittville, but unfortunately we can't get stuck in the pre-race action because it is a New South Wales track where, as I've said in previous videos, our back bets in aggregate, in aggregate cannot exceed 1,000 Australian dollars before getting hit with a hefty charge. So, usual draw, firing in some lays. Um, Liquidity is a bit thinner here, so this price could move a little bit more violently. We're in a good position here so far. Um, and I'm going to try and scale out my money at around 15 to 1 or 20 to 1. So, looks good for now, but we are closing in on the final few furlongs. And if this price doesn't start go clawing its way up, then we're going to have to scratch scratch as quickly as possible and we are leaving it late in the day 
maybe I'm risking it here and I'm not gonna chance it, I'm gonna get out. And there you have it, the horse has gone on to win. So that was the perfect call. And that should emphasize why you have to be disciplined when it comes to things like this. When it comes to the final few furlongs, if the price isn't where you anticipate it to be, just cut it. Just take the small loss and just wait for the next opportunity. Okay, so back to Ballarat and for a track that's supposed to be the feature for today, there's only 200 grand matched before we go in play, which is really dire. That's not a good sign for things to come. Um, we made a small mess pre-race, so we escaped with just a small two pound loss. But um, it looks like there's a bit of back support here on this favorite, so we're gonna try and jump onto the back of that and hopefully make a chunk here. Only problem is the liquidity is so thin. Um, you know, we don't want to be too overexposed. So that's why I'm only using a 20 pound stake. This price spikes against me. It's going to do so very quickly and I'm not going to be able to escape uh, without taking a hefty hit, which is looking like the case here, unfortunately. Um, yeah, price moved very quickly against me. Liquidity is not there and I had to eat the loss. So that's, uh, that's very disappointing. Also, I skipped the last race at Morfittville just because the liquidity was so dire. It wasn't really worth uh, recording for a session. So just gonna jump straight back to Kembla Grange. I think I only I barely lost a five on the last race. So um, yeah, just to save time, we'll, we'll go back to Kembla Grange, which is a much better track, like I said. But um, in play, usual drill. Um, just finding some lay bets here on this favorite. And we worked our way into a good position. We timed it and executed it pretty well to this point. Now we're just waiting to catch that spike. As is often the case, it's just about timing. It's all about timing. Um, whereas you, with UK racing, you wanna wait till the race develops before you take a position. At least that's how I like to trade. Australian racing is completely the opposite, where I like to take a position as early as possible and then let it mature. Um, the only difference being is that when it gets into the final third or the final few furlongs of the race, if the price hasn't moved where you want it to, then you have to scratch it because the price is gonna move so violently in the last few furlongs, um, you're not gonna be able to, uh, to get out. So, yeah, that's the difference between UK and Australian racing for for my style of trading. So, yeah, in this case, we're entering the final third of the race and the price just isn't moving where we want to go. And this could move very violently against us if we're not quick enough. So we're going to uh, scratch it for a small loss here. And, and we couldn't get out for the full stake and the price moved against us. So I was a little bit distracted there as I was talking. Not an excuse. I should have known better but that's a needless 25 pound loss. So things are getting quite tough out here today. Okay, so back to Ballarat. And even though there's only a 60 or so grand matched with four minutes out, one thing that really stands out to me on this race is how much of the liquidity is stacked up within these three, four tick range on this favorite, which is absolutely ideal for scalping, which I love to see uh, when I do trade pre-race. So I'm just gonna fire in some stakes either side of the price and just nip in, nip out. Um, hopefully build our position up to around 15, 20 quid before the off. Well, I wish I got involved a little bit sooner there, but 27 pounds is more than good enough for me uh, pre-race. Now let's try and top this up in play. Liquidity picked up really quickly actually in the final couple of minutes, which is a good sign. Um, but usual drill, just jump in front of this lay money. And as you can see here, there's around two grand there on the lay side. Now, when you see random bricks of money like that, it's usually an indication that someone is spoofing. Um, usually when it's a, just an outlier like that. So I, I don't really trust that money. So I'm not gonna go that hard on it. I'm not gonna fire in 100 pound stakes just because I see that money because if that money disappears then we're going to be left naked and ex exposed here and if the price goes against us we'll be in a lot of trouble but 
I'm more than happy to lay for 50 pound ticks, 50 pound stakes rather. And there's that spike which we're looking for. And I've pretty much traded this race inch perfectly. 120 quid there. Um, yeah, good trade. Pre race and in play was perfect there. So happy with that. I also hope the last few races have highlighted how important it is to be disciplined and be patient and take the small losses, even if they're more frequent than the wins. Um, it's important to do that if it means waiting for that one opportunity which you can just where you can just drop the hammer and and cash out for a big win. Um, it's much better to do that than take small wins, small wins, small wins, and then a big loss wiping out all your profits. So this trading session looks like it looks like it's going to be one of those days where there isn't an awful lot of opportunity, and I am going to have to take more frequent losses and yeah, less frequent big wins. Um, so yeah, we're going to have to we're going to have to adjust our trading accordingly. Anyway, Kembla Grange. 160 grand matched. Liquidity, despite being similar to the last race, and well, actually, it's lower than the last race. And you can see that just by looking at the price out of it, there's literally no money going through it other than that 400 pound stake here on the lay side. So, usual drill, just gonna jump in front of it. All right, this. Oh. Right, this money's getting eaten up, eaten up pretty quickly, so we're going to scratch our position and uh, and back it, and hopefully catch a spike downwards. And come on, it looked like it tried to break it, and then it just bounced north, which is very unusual. That that was a very hard race to read, um, and a needless loss there. So yeah, on to the next. Okay, so the last two races were. At Ballarat and Morfordville, but honestly, they were just such low quality. I, I didn't even bother <laughs> recording them, but I made a fiver and another three pounds respectively. So I made eight quid off those last two races, but it was just so dire. I just couldn't be bothered to record it. And I don't want to ramble saying the same thing over and over every video. So I've skipped straight to Kembla Grange. Um, again, this isn't looking that great either, to be honest. And that seems to be the theme for today but we're gonna hopefully make some money off this and you know with hindsight i didn't trade this too well i sh there was no reason for me to fire in three lay bets especially when the liquidity is so low here um the only reason why i did that is because i can see there's literally no back support at all um so we're really gonna have to lower our exit positions here and one of our stakes has been matched at eight to one and the price has shot out pretty quickly so managed to get away with overstaking a little bit over there it was the right call to make but we should have lowered our stakes but we got away with it so that's another 18 pounds of the bin we'll take that also once again skip the last two races just because it was such low quality at ballarat and ascot where we made two small losses i think three pounds or nine pounds um but even for the races I skipped, you're gonna see my profit and loss at the end of the session anyway. So you're gonna see all my results. So you don't need to worry in that regard. But yeah, back to back to Ballarat again. Um, and yeah, there's a bit more liquidity this time on this race. It's 350 grand matched. But having said that, it does look quite thin in play. So we're gonna tread carefully see a bit of back support coming in for this favorite here so I am gonna jump in but only for a tenner this time I don't want to be left uh, too overexposed if this price spikes against us and yeah we got that drop in price right at the right time execute that pretty much inch perfectly so a nice 23 pounds in the bin there okay back to Ballarat by the way guys, I'm trading the cricket side by side with the racing here. So yeah, it's gonna be a little bit difficult to record every race trade alongside the racing. So even less reason to turn on the camera for these really low quality races. All 
Right, it's like there's a lot of a lot of laying going on on this first horse here. Um, but the price is quite the market's quite thin. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna jump in. Um, we're just gonna fire in just a, a teaser stake here. Just sit well outside the price and hopefully get matched. Hopefully catch a spike and, and we caught it right there perfectly. Good thing about this is that there's a lot of lay money here, as you can see, stacked up. So if the price does start piling in, we've got more than enough time to escape. But that doesn't look like the case. Looks like the horse was lost. So nice and easy seven pound in the bin, just by plugging the gaps on the price ladder there. Okay, six o'clock back to Ballarat. There's a big 800 pound stake there sitting on the lay side, so naturally we're just going to jump in front of that and hopefully catch a spike as usual now that lay money looks like it's disappearing and it looks like it's getting eaten up pretty quickly which is not what we want to see this late in the race so we're just going to flip our position here and it's gone all the way down to evens but <laughs> as soon as we change our stakes to try and get out the price literally rockets all the way up north against us so Someone suggested last week actually, why, why do I not use keyboard shortcuts? And instances like this is perfect justification for me to do so because I've just lost out on potentially 20 pounds. I've turned a, a potential 20 pound profit into a 20 pound loss just because I wasn't quick enough. So that's really disappointing. Okay, so Ascot. Now this track is usually pretty crap in Australia but because there's such a lack of opportunity uh, today and there's around 200 grand match on this race sometimes it does throw up chances so it's worth just having a look um, between the big meetings so because you never know but i have managed to identify some weak support here on the second horse and there's around 300 pounds sitting there so we're just going to jump in front of it but as usual, if it, if it starts getting eaten up and if that money starts disappearing, then we have to get out. So it looks like, well, it looks like that stake has disappeared and we are a little bit exposed. It's a liability we can handle. So if we don't see that, we don't see that price shoot up, then we are going to have to exit. And looks like we've got away with it in this instance. But to be honest, I didn't trade that well. I, that was lazy risk management on my half. Um, there was no liquidity there. I should have got out the race, but look, I'm not perfect. And we, we got away with it in that instance. I want to skip right to pretty much the last race of the session. And the, the last few races have been really boring. Made a fiver, lost a fiver, lost a fiver. Um, so it's just a lot of monotonous back and forth, which you guys probably don't want to see. So we're just going to go straight to the last uh, race at Kembla uh, Grange here before we turn our attention fully to the cricket. So let's try and close out with a good trade. Um, yeah, just, just firing in a, just a teaser trade here for a tanner. Um, approaching the halfway mark. And and catch that spike upward. All right, final few furlongs here. The price is going in the right direction. Let's try and scale out some, some of our money up here. And Again, we left it very late in the day, but uh, yeah, we got away with it. And that's uh, another 15 quid in the bin. All right, so this is how things are shaping up so far this morning. 104 pounds off the Australian racing. And to be honest, I'd give myself a six out of 10 for the way I've traded this session. My risk management was probably a bit more lax than it should have been. And that's cost me probably around, let's have a look. 10, 30, 40, 70, 90, 110, around 120 pounds worth of losses there. So I'd give myself a six out of 10. I mean, that's that's more losses than ordinarily I'd like, I'd like to have. 
but you know what maybe I'd give myself a slight pass just because the action was really poor this morning and that's looking like the case for the next couple of months even it, it doesn't look that great so thankfully the test cricket is coming just in time so I'm gonna record a few sessions of those for you guys to see how I tackle those markets but um, yeah we'll take a hundred quid uh, especially given how how poor it was like I said but now we're gonna turn our attention back to the one day cricket so hopefully we can at least double our money for this morning session and take the afternoon off so let's give it a go all right so time for some uh, cricket trading some one day action by the way I'm trading this side by side with uh, with the horse racing so yeah I'm, I'm gonna have to focus on two things at once here um, with regards to, to cricket as a whole, test cricket is always my preferred format. Then it's one day, and I usually stay away from T20, and I wouldn't touch 10 over cricket with a barge pole. Anyway, Australia, England, uh, we have here. Second match of the series. England lost the opener, so they have to win here to avoid the series defeat. Now, before, before a match begins, there's a few things I usually look at, namely the pitch, and it's being played at the SEG, the Sydney Cricket Ground. Um, if we look back at some of the pitch stats, we can see that this pitch has averaged around 300 runs for the last five or so years. First innings has dropped off a bit recently, but 300 seems to be around par, and there's been some crazy scores um, not so long ago as well. The last match that was played here, I think it was the last game, Australia-India, a couple of years ago now, um, Australia scored 389 and 374 in their, in their innings, whilst India scored 308 and 338. So, scores are gettable here. Um, Australia batting first too, by the way, which is an advantage. Um, as you can see here, the team batting first has won over 50% of the matches at the ground. So, again, this benefits the Aussies. And finally, if we look at the, the leading batters on this pitch, David Warner's number one, Steve Smith, who's on form as of late, is second, and Mitchell Marsh is eighth. And they're all featured in today's squad, so, I'm liking the look of this Australia side. Finally, there's the untangible things which you can't measure but will certainly play an influence in the game, such as the fact that England is still high on World, Club, <coughs> World Cup glory. They haven't been uh, well rested. They got beaten comfortably in the first game. So those are all important considerations to make. So how am I going to approach this? Well, with regards to the match odds, like I said, 300s around par. So Boundaries aren't exactly going to be at a premium. Um, so, unless they're literally smashing sixes and fours every over, this is about the right price. I'm going to back them for half a stake for now until I get some confirmation as to what I think is going to happen. So, depending on how these openers handle themselves and what price Australia is when Smith gets to the crease, I'll be tempted to maybe raise my average entry by backing at high odds. England can certainly do some damage, and I think there's every chance that they could trade shorter at some point, but I don't like making too many predictions pre-match, so I'm just gonna back for half a stake now. Um, just just get in for just a, just a small amount of money and manage my position there. With regards to the first innings uh, that runs the runs market, as I said, I'm expecting Australia to get around 300. Um, they're batting first. Market seems to have it pretty much spot on as it's priced at 1.6, so they seem to agree and I do expect that to come in at some point and if we get a better price above evens perhaps de depending on how the innings is shaping up I'll be tempted to I'll be tempted to fire in another another half stake but we'll see what happens all right so here we are at the halfway mark and things panned out a little bit differently to how I imagined I mean it was a very slow wicket but with the position they were in, I was certainly expecting them, expecting them to get at least 290, 300, possibly higher. Um, so this is definitely a subpar score, in my opinion. I did manage to scratch my innings run bet for around a 50% loss. I mean, for 300, it never traded below 1.6, so that was just that was really disappointing. Um, but again, when it's the right call to make, you make it. If if it you know, if it doesn't go your way, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, most important thing is that we 
that is a manageable loss you know we, st we staked correctly we didn't go all in on it thankfully so 28 pound loss on that market is no big deal whatsoever but uh with the match odds you know boundaries turn out to be at, at a premium and the australia price did drift out to as high as around 2.5 but given the form steve smith was in in the first game um he had a brilliant partnership with manas labashain to anchor the innings so i made a well-timed back bet with two additional stakes at around evens and then rode it out to around 1.5 1.6 before leveling up but for the second innings i think england can definitely make this a competitive game um it's not an easy total but with malan opening the batting he did score a century in the first game i'm not going to back england straight away simply because things haven't panned out so far as i'd hoped so let's see how the first five ten overs go and as soon as we get the confirmation we want we'll we'll take it from there all right so quick interval break and take a quick trip to mcdonald's just because i'm so hungry <laughs> but um yeah i'm feeling a little bit of pressure uh for this second innings just because in the first game the first match of this series i made around 150 quid um you know any, anywhere between 100 200 quid on a one day game is good enough for me i bet very small compared to test cricket where i make an awful lot more money um so yeah i didn't exactly predict this first innings that well so yeah pressure's on to do better than i did in the first uh, in the first one day game um because yeah i'm kind of kicking myself I, I didn't record myself trade that instead so yeah hopefully the second innings goes well are they can i get a Egg McMuffin meal. Can I get an extra egg in there? So it's double yeah, egg. Yeah, chocolate egg. Uh, double egg. No worries. Drink. Uh, white coffee and uh, chocolate chip cookie. You sure can. Anything else, sir? That's it, thanks. Thanks very much, sir. Next week, please, I'll see you a bit. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Nothing like a bit of dessert for breakfast. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Just look at that goodness. All right, so here's the end result. And um, yeah, this was a potentially dangerous second innings to trade and I really dodged a bullet here by not backing England from the start as they ended up losing two wickets in the first over. <laughs> um, nothing seems to be working out for Jason Roy at the moment, but there you go. Anyway, James Vince came to the crease. Now bear in mind, it's his home ground as a Sydney Sixer uh, in the 2020 uh, Big Bash League. So, I kept an eye on England just because of him and I was looking for just any sort of partnership at this point and in the sixth over, boom, another wicket, Phil Salt uh, was bowled out. So at this point I was just expecting a, a whitewash and I wasn't planning on making a trade. Then Sam Billings came to the crease and I realised he's a former, well he's a Sydney Sixers player as well and lo and behold they secure around 121 partnership and I piggybacked on the Australia price just by laying them at 1.3. Um, I think they touched as high as 4 to 1. I think they hit like 3.2 or something like that. Anyway, Vince got, James Vince got bowled out and I was up 300 at that point. And as you can see what happened to the odds here, it came all the way back to evens, below evens. And I ended up giving up, giving back like 100, 150 quid even. Um, Moe Nadi got a few boundaries and then that nudged the price back up a bit and at this point I wasn't going to chance it so I cashed out thankfully and England just collapsed from there. The pitch was starting to to wear up and the spinners got to work. Adam Zampa took care of the middle order, low order so yeah, close out with a £170 profit. I, when it hit 1.2 I tried to scalp it a little bit as you can see there. Uh, not too successfully though. So, um, But yeah, I'm happy with that. I mean, the key here is just patience, you know, you just, it's just a matter of waiting for the opportunities to present themselves and that often means sitting on your hands for extended periods of time, which is pretty difficult to do when, it, when you consider you're sitting there for seven hours. Um, you know, a lot of things happened that I didn't anticipate, but at the end of the day I was disciplined with my staking and my entries, mostly. <laughs> uh, I did give a bit of profit back. 
but you're not going to make every call correctly you don't even need to be right most of the time just just like horse racing as long as you can let go of positions when things aren't going your way and maximize your profits when you make the right call you'll be fine in the long run sorry my camera cut earlier so it's evening now and i went out just freshened up um but as i was saying uh look i know 170 pounds may not look particularly impressive especially on a market where you know tens of millions are being matched but when you make 50 or so trades like that in a year and you combine that with the 50 or so sundays that i trade golf and by the way i will be recording myself trading tomorrow's final round of the dp world tour championship um anyway that's 100 extra markets and it adds up to five figures profit both of which aren't even my bread and butter when it comes to trading so don't knock it besides there's there's guys out there who are far more specialist than me when it comes uh, to one day cricket and they stake an awful lot more than I do and it's important to be aware of what you're up against um, but if you guys do want to see more impressive trades that I make like I'm talking the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 pound profits um, that I make then you'll have to watch me trade a test match and the test the test season actually starts soon so it starts next week um, only thing is it's gonna be a real challenge to record since it's five days long and I'm away so but if that's something you guys want to see then I'm happy to share that with you so let me know in the comments below if you know if that's something you want to see I, I hope this kind of content helps I understand it's not everyone's cup of tea uh, you know the way I operate um, my UK racing is a lot more methodical but I don't really get stuck in on that till after March. Um, that's just how my trading calendar stacks up. It's November right now, so if the opportunity is not there for me, then I won't touch it. But I do hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, it's something different. Please, do, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, comment. Uh, give me feedback. I respond most of the time. And I'll see you guys soon. Peace.